Germany has had for many years a tradition of youth organizations. There were many wide and varied groups, some being linked with a particular church or political party, others were non-sectarian. Most of these groups shared a common theme of comradeship and healthy exercise. Over the years, some of these groups united and flourished, whilst others simply faded away, largely due to the character of their leader. But there can be no doubt whatsoever that the largest and by far the most successful of these organizations was the Hitler Youth, the Hitler Jugend. The Nazi party had its roots in the infant German Workers' Party, which Adolf Hitler reluctantly joined in 1919. By 1921, this had become the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP, with Hitler as its leader. In the summer of 1921, an 18-year-old former German National Youth Movement leader, Gustav Adolf Lenk, applied to join the NSDAP, but was refused as he was considered underage. Lenk, however, persisted, and he was so enthusiastic that by 1922, a youth league of the NSDAP had been formed under his leadership. Membership was for Aryan Germans aged 14 to 18 years. Foreigners and Jews were not to be admitted. However, the Sturmabteilung, or the SA, which was the NSDAP's private army, thought it necessary to exercise strict control over the new youth organization to ensure its loyalty to the Führer and the correct National Socialist principles, and above all, to ensure it did not become too independent. The Youth League became divided into two age groups, 14 to 16 years and 16 to 18 years, the latter becoming known as the Jungsturm Adolf Hitler. However, it soon became apparent to the SA that Lenk was perhaps a little too keen, and it appeared that his leadership was steering the youth movement on a more independent course. He was eventually ousted after being accused of financial irregularities, and was replaced by a new leader, Kurt Gruber. In 1926, the movement was renamed the Hitler Jugend, with Gruber appointed as the Reichsführer. By now, there were many prominent members in the movement, and one in particular was to become a threat to Gruber's leadership. Baldur von Schirach was the Reichsführer of the NS Student League and an active member of the SA. Schirach was well liked by an army captain, Ernst Ruhm, who Hitler had appointed by a special request to take over as leader of the SA, thus in turn being responsible for the supervision of the Hitler Youth. Both Ruhm and Schirach plotted against Gruber, and in 1931, again on Hitler's direct instruction, Gruber was dismissed. Schirach took on a new role and a new title of Reichsjugendführer, which gave him total control under the SA of all youth matters. Eight months later, he took over direct control of the Hitler Youth. He enlisted many new and more senior leaders into the organization. One of these was Obergebietsführer Ritter von Schleich, a World War I air ace, known as the Black Knight and holder of the Blue Max. In 1933, Hitler was appointed as Chancellor. All youth sections of the now outlawed left-wing political parties soon vanished. The remaining non-political youth groups, under immense pressure, soon followed suit. Hitler ordered the Hitler Youth to seize all records from the Reichs Committee of German Youth Associations. Von Schirach was to replace the committee by his own German Youth Leaders' Council. He was again given a new title. He became Jugendführer des Deutschen Reiches, youth leader of the German Reich. Now all German youth came within his authority, and all of the remaining organizations were swallowed up by the Hitler Youth. There was one more episode which was to finally consolidate the power of the Hitler Youth. In June 1934, in the belief that the SA was plotting a revolt against his authority, had most of its leaders executed, including his friend, Captain Rommel. It was the SS, Hitler's private bodyguard, that carried out the assassinations. The Hitler Youth soon associated itself with the already powerful SS. Both Hitler and von Schirach believed that the youth movement represented the Nazi of the future, and from its ranks would rise the future leaders. It was clearly Hitler's plan to rebuild a Germany 
which was militarily strong enough to embark upon another war of conquest. Membership of the Hitler Youth had now risen to over 8 million, and in this grand plan, it was intended to play an important role. Compulsory service was finally introduced in March 1939 to all of those over 17 years of age, followed in 1941 by membership being obligatory for both sexes over the age of 10 years. My interest in the Hitler Youth came about because some years ago I started to write a novel and the two main characters were an English boy, teenage boy, and a German. They were very good friends before the war. And I then, my story would carry on saying what happened to them after, uh, after they became enemies. And I decided just for the purposes of the story, it would be a good idea if the German boys in the Hitler Youth. I then had to start finding out what the Hitler Youth was and what they did. I'd always known of the existence, but I didn't know any details. And so I started doing a bit of research and found it was a very intriguing um, subject and started collecting a few things. And the result was I ended up writing a book on the Hitler Youth, whereas the other one never got published. In the early days of the movement, members were recruited on an entirely voluntary basis. But it wasn't long before many inducements or persuasions became apparent. And not all of them were particularly subtle. If a young person wanted to be involved in a sports club, for instance, he would first have to show proof of Hitler Jugend membership. Several already established youth movements joined en bloc in the hope of keeping the membership alive within the Hitler Youth. They were faced with the blunt option of join now or your soon to be illegal organization will be immediately and totally disbanded. In the very early days, it was really like any other youth club. Somebody decided they would start up a little group and other people said, this sounds rather like fun, let's go and join it. And um, one man I met quite recently, he told me how at the age of 12, He's um, a friend of his in the same apartment building, who was much his senior, said, oh, you're a musician, you, you play the piano. You come and join us and you can be part of the band. And he was recruited on the strength of his musical ability, regardless of anything else. And that was at a time when they normally wouldn't have had anybody in until they were at least 14 years old. And so it went on like that. And then about 1936, the regulations came in, saying it was a, a legal requirement that youngsters should join the Hitler Youth in its various components. This wasn't really very much in, enforced, but in 1939 the, the law was re-enacted and subsequently was very firmly enforced. Anybody who failed to attend meetings, or first of all, anybody who failed to join would be chased up, and this could have very serious consequences for the parents. A civil servant whose youngster did not belong could obviously find himself, his job would be on the line. It would be very bad, certainly, if not for his job, his promotion chances. And I heard a case very recently of um, a man was telling me of a fat man who had three sons. They went to church on Sunday with the family. The police arrived and said, why didn't they attend the Hitler Youth meetings? They were in the Hitler Youth, but they went to church in preference. He was fined for that. The next week, the same thing happened. The fine was doubled. The week after that, the fine was doubled again. And the next time, the police came and took him away, heading for prison or a concentration camp. By sheer good luck, they had to change trains. And at that point, it so happened that a, a Gestapo officer, a friend of the father, saw this on the station, came over and said, what are you doing here? What's all this about? And the story was explained. The Gestapo officer then had a quiet word to the two policemen, and his friend went home back to the family. Now, history doesn't relate what happened on the next Sunday. I'm hoping to find out eventually whether the father had to go and cave in. But uh, this was very much the typical thing. And I had in my book a little chit made out, your son missed three uh, attendances without excuse. It would be big trouble if he doesn't turn up again. Every ten-year-old was asked to enrol in either the Deutsche Jungfolk or Jungmädels on the 20th of April as a present for their beloved Führer on his 47th birthday. On that occasion they would have been told, from today your life belongs to the Führer, and now you are a guarantor of the future of the fatherland. After a probationary period of about six months, they would take the Pinfenprobe test and thereafter would be allowed to wear the brown shirt and leather cross strap. It was almost unknown for a youngster to be failed in this test, the result of which would be recorded in his proficiency record. 
Such testing could include what was known as a mutprobe, a requirement for some form of physical combat proficiency. One former member wrote that part of his test was the requirement to jump out of a first story window in full marching order. The Hitler ideal for the children of Germany was indeed a doctrine of cradle to the grave progression which he had so carefully planned for every citizen. At the age of six, the German child began school. At ten, he or she would be expected to join the Deutsche Jungfolk and could then be selected for grammar school. At twelve came a second chance of selection for grammar school or, after a long selection process, a boy might win a place at an Adolf Hitler school. Those who remained in the normal school system had the choice of opting for either a trade or a technical orientated education. Fourteen was the age for transfer to the Hitler Youth. At eighteen, the boys would be expected to join the party or one of its specialist organizations. The girls could continue until twenty-one in faith and beauty, specializing in the preparation for the three Ks deemed so important for the German woman. These were Kinder, Kesche, Küche, children, church and kitchen. The new German woman was expected to be beautiful and healthy. She should be useful around the house and hold the correct political outlook. She should also be competent in first aid and also willing to lend a hand on the land. The children in any good national socialist household were made aware at an early age that all good things in life came through because of Adolf Hitler. In preschool groups, the various women's organizations built on these foundations to develop in each child a lifelong devotion to our beloved Führer. The process of indoctrination continued at school. Every lesson began and ended with the German greeting, Heil Hitler, said with an upraised right arm. For slightly older children, there was an additional lesson to be learned. Both they and their beloved Führer have the same enemies. Even to children of this very early age, and in classes that did include Jewish youngsters, one message would be repeated over and over again. The Jews are our misfortune. After many years of such forceful indoctrination, the child would chant anti-Semitic slogans almost subconsciously. The Führer's belief was that the training and education of character came before the training of intellect. Throughout their education, from the earliest years, children of the Nazi era were repeatedly taught that the finest thing they could do was the thing they would be expected to do, to die for their country and for their Führer. Bands were very much in evidence in the Hitler Youth Movement. The long fanfare trumpet with its red, white and red banner soon became recognized as a symbol of the Hitler Jugend. From a very early age, even the Jungvolk were part of the unit band. On big occasions, some of these small band units would combine. On the march, something the Hitler Youth did often, singing was routine. Many youngsters damaged their voices by shouting rather than singing the required aggressive or defiant chants. The youth were taught that the flag should mean more to them than death itself. It symbolized a new era. From the very early days, the Hitler Youth had its own distinct flag and made much use of it. They were displayed on every possible occasion, unusually en masse. In addition to the respect that the Hitler Youth had for its own flags and standards, members of the general public would be expected, in fact required, to raise an arm in the German greeting whenever a Hitler Youth flag was carried past them. The keystone of discipline in the Hitler Youth was the Führerprinzip, principle of leadership. Authority devolving down from the very highest leader in each party organization, who could only have reached that appointment by being appointed by the Führer himself. So it followed that any order, even one given by a 13 or 14 year old youth, carried the full authority of Adolf Hitler and therefore must be strictly obeyed. Blind, unquestioning obedience was the phrase most often used. In 1934, a Streifendienst, or patrol service, operated as the Hitler Youth's own military police, ensuring general discipline on the streets. They would watch for petty crime and checking that Hitler Youth members had polished footwear and the correct uniforms at all times. 
members' pockets were also checked, for it was an offence to carry anything other than essential documents, a clean handkerchief and a comb. The SRD also had to ensure good behaviour in the youth hostels. If they found a group with a cooking fire in the woods, for example, severe punishments would follow. In addition, the SRD would be on the lookout for any suggestion of dissent or subversion amongst their fellow members, and, equally important, amongst their parents and families. Some of the SRD, who had been specially selected for this area of work, cooperated closely with the SS and Gestapo. After moving up from the Jungburg, a boy could apply to join the SRD. Before being accepted, he had to face a panel consisting of leaders from both the SS and the Hitler Jugend, as well as doctors. If he passed the strict screening and also met all of the requirements regarding political loyalty, physical fitness, racial type and purity, he might be admitted to the SRD. Once admitted, training came under SS control and sport took an important place, especially boxing and jiu-jitsu. The recruits also had to study policing, traffic control and firefighting. One member in ten of the Hitler Youth had a leader position of some sort and was authorised to give orders, to award praise or blame and, when appropriate, to carry out punishment. The youth wore a party uniform. The party was the state. Therefore, any such action was tantamount to an attack upon the state and would have been severely dealt with. When I speak to Germans and ask them two questions, what was the best thing you remember of the Hitler Youth and what was the worst? Inevitably, they come up with the answer, the comradeship was the, the best thing. In many ways, it was simply a question of being, we're all kids together and we're all equal. One of the things was that the children from the poorer homes found themselves literally rubbing shoulders with, and indeed, if it got to that sort of a situation, sitting on youngsters of a very much richer background. And they, they met on a degree of equality, and this a lot of them liked very much. And again, people have told me just this, that I was talking to and doing things with boys that I w wouldn't have given me a second look uh, had we been in civilian clothing with our different backgrounds. And the worst thing was the uh, political education, which sort of bored most of them stiff. They would get um, lectures they had to, had to be given. The people, the kids who were older kids giving the lecture didn't understand what they were reading out. And they were very embarrassed if a more intelligent youngster asked a question. There's the case of one boy having been told how wonderfully everything was going in Germany. You know, the Fuhrer was working wonders with their economy. And at the end of the time he said, well, if that's the case, why is it my mother can't go out and buy some real coffee? After that, no more questions were allowed after the end of the political sessions, because the question, any more questions could be equally embarrassing, and nobody had an answer for them. In the same way, there was a BDM group, and they were being told that before very long it would be their duty to start having children for the Fuhrer. You know, the more children, the better. And one girl, she said, quite without giving any thought to it at all, said, but why is it that the Fuhrer does not get married himself and he have children? And the leader didn't know what to say and just, just changed the subject and looked daggers at her and reminded them they were all on parade on next Tuesday and must be in spotless condition. Embarrassing questions usually had no answer. The cultivation of physical fitness, or more correctly in this case, fighting fitness, was a major preoccupation of the Hitler Youth, taking precedence over even political education. As much as two-thirds of the training time was taken up with exercises to toughen up the body, and this applied equally to both girls and boys alike. Sport played a dominant part in this process, but only those disciplines which had a bearing on military preparedness were practiced. There was no ice skating, or golf, or tennis in the Hitler Youth. On the other hand, a great deal of time and effort was dedicated to shooting and marching, likewise with boxing, wrestling, athletics and cross-country running. This would produce healthy and tough recruits for later use in the armed forces. There was also the more unusual sport of club throwing. This particular sport was one of the proficiency requirements. It is interesting to note that the clubs used bore a direct resemblance to the potato masher hand grenade as used by the Wehrmacht leaving little doubt as to why this sport was so much encouraged. Cycling was popular as a sport in its own right, 
as an alternative in the proficiency test. The proficiency awards in various grades were given to both boys and girls, achieving a specified standard for age. They were recorded in the record book, together with a specified knowledge of political matters and officially approved songs. There was a national sports competition, held to find from each sport the best team or individual in the whole Reich. Every competitor who achieved a required number of points received an impressive certificate. They were also awarded specially and highly coveted prized badges, which they could wear with pride for the remainder of the year. Hitler required his youth to be as swift as the Greyhound, as tough as leather, and as hard as Krupp steel. The program of conventional sporting activities certainly helped to achieve this, but there were many other ways of toughening a boy, both in mind as well as body. The official training manual of the Hitler Youth shows a vast physical exercise and game type activities. These could be performed solo, in twos and threes, and by teams of any number. Frequently, there was an element of combat or contact involved. In addition, tumbling and ground gymnastics were popular and often provided a dramatic demonstration of public occasions. Obstacle races were organized over permanent courses with tough features such as high walls, deep ditches and poles to run along or pass under. On a temporary site, anything that came to hand would be utilized. Farm carts, barrels or failing that, other boys could be used to vault over or crawl under. These field exercises could take many forms and would involve anything from a single Kameradschaft or Jungenschaft to up to several hundred boys. Such games usually had a military nature and took place wherever space could be found. common and popular with most, though by no means all of the boys. Two units, identified by the colour of the wall thread tied around one arm, would compete against each other. The Fuhrer had said that he wanted a cruel, unflinching youth, so courage tests were a common activity. Sport was a very important part of the Hitler Youth because one, the youngsters would largely enjoy it, Two, the great thing was to have a good sound body and a sound mind. And people who met the, um, the Germans in the war said that there was a very nasty comparison between the health of the German youngsters.
and the English soldiers who were opposed to them. The Hitler youth had been out of doors doing active things like this, and the English kids had been sort of in smoke-filled towns and cities, and poorly nourished and so forth. And uh, the German ob object was to produce a good, hard, fit soldier who would do what he was told and keep on doing it, even under hard conditions. So sport was very, very much part and parcel of the exercise. And again, it was a great thing to put on big spectacles. They had big sports meetings and everybody arrived and the leaders of all the Nazi organizations were put in an appearance and there was a tremendous uh, atmosphere of solidarity. And with the girls, they did a lot of sport too and also um, a lot of sort of dancing exercises, maybe out there with all of them with their hoops and 500 girls would do this and that and uh, all in, in, in rhythm and time. Very spectacular. A bit like the opening ceremonies of the Olympics today. And this was all showing we are all together, we are, we are the future of Germany. That was the great cry of the Hitler Youth. That we are the future of Germany, which of course was literally true. During Hitler's stay of office, marching became a national pastime for the Nazis. It was encouraged to build a feeling of unity within the party organizations and to demonstrate the power of the party to those who had not yet joined. It was also a useful form of discipline and helped to build up the muscles needed by a future soldier. Ironically, as a result of so much marching, great numbers of young recruits from the Hitler Youth into the Wehrmacht were rejected because of flat feet. Hitler Youths, whilst marching, were under strict orders not to greet or even acknowledge acquaintances, and that even applied to their own families. An important part of the Hitler Youth marching was the Fahrt, or journey, which sent thousands of youngsters of both sexes traveling throughout the length and breadth of the fatherland. The Kleiner Fahrt, small journey, lasted 36 hours, with an overnight stop either in a hostel or in tents. This march was a routine part of the proficiency tests. The Gorsfahrt, long journey, which was either marching or bicycle, could last up to one month or more and might include a train or boat journey. An average day's march would be well in excess of 15 miles, or 25 kilometers. The nights would be spent in a variety of accommodation. Some form of adventure was also worked into the journey program. A youngster was required to keep a daily record of events. One great purpose of these journeys was to help youngsters get to know more about their own country and its former glories. Historic buildings were often visited, especially those with a bloody or noble past. in München grüßen die Fahnen des Gebietes Hochlands die ersten Toten der Bewegung.
greatest march of the Hitler Youth Year was Der March zum Führer. From 1935 onwards, every Hitler Youth unit in the Reich marched its flag to Nuremberg to be paraded before Hitler during the Reichsparteitag celebrations. Great distances had to be covered by the flag bearers, who had an escort and often a band to accompany them. Für Jahr stehen die Abordnungen der deutschen Jugend hier angetreten. Wieder werden wir ihre Botschaft in Ehrfurcht hören und treu befolgen. Das Versprechen. Die Millionenmasse aller unserer deutschen Jungen und Mädchen im ganzen Reich. 
Sardin Samuel und Vergehen. Generationen wachsen oft heran, ohne dass es ihnen vergönnt ist, wirklich ein großes Schicksal zu erleben oder gar mitzugestalten. Unsere Generation hat die Versehung auch erlesen. Großes an unserem Feld zu erleben und Größeres noch an ihm zu gestalten. Ihr seid nun die Zeugen geworden eines großen geschichtlichen Vorgangs, der sich oft in Jahrhunderten nicht wiederholt. Ihr seid selber in diesen Jahren Kämpfer gewesen für dieses neue, größere Deutschland. Ohne Messlich sind die Aufgaben. Wir uns gestellt sind, wie immer sind wir nicht erzogen in den alten Generationen, sondern es wird erzogen immer und immer. <lacht> Wenn nicht einmal die Vorsehung von meinem Volk wegnehmen wird, dann werde ich den kommenden Führer ein Volk hinterlassen, das eisern fest zusammengefällt und zusammengeschlossen ist. Dafür seid ihr mir alle Junge und Junge, Mädchen und Mädchen erranten. Und wer hat immer noch in deutschen Landen am besten gebaut, der vertraut auf das deutsche Volk. Und das seid ihr. the return journey was made by Landsberg to attend the huge torchlight ceremony to commemorate Adolf Hitler's incarceration in the fortress there.
the earliest days, camping was an important part of the Hitler Youth program, with the summer camp as the highlight in the year. Camps were usually under canvas, in marquees, bell tents and smaller shelters constructed by the boys themselves. Discipline was evident. There were the most rigid examples of straight lines of precisely placed tents. In the bigger camps, cooking tended to be centralized using the army-style field kitchen. Meals would be eaten from tables made by digging trenches for the diner's feet. In the center of the camp would be the fireplace with similar trenches cut out around the campfire. After an evening meal, the boys would be encouraged to gather there for the evening singing and speeches from their leaders. In 1934 onwards, great numbers of boys, and in later years girls too, were sent to camps in the country to work on the land. One of the big activities of the Hitler Youth was the so-called land yard or land year. In actual fact, the youngsters went off and lived in hostels and worked on the local farms for about a, an eight-month period in the year. This, I think, was largely um, a way of coping with unemployment. These were youngsters who would be coming onto the employment market. And if they were kept out there, well, they were doing a useful job and they weren't sculling around in the streets without finding a job. It was very much, again, a sort of camping. I mean, they called them camps, although they were under, uh, in, in big houses largely. Again, they would have all the activities of the Hitler Youth. Um, they would have a, probably have a band. Uh, they might well have sentries at the gate presenting arms with shovels because they were working on the land. I have a photograph of um, a bunch of youngsters, I think they're about sort of 45 youngsters and 20 pairs of boxing gloves lined up, showing the equipment they had. And um, it was a, a way of finding employment for them and helping out the farmers too. And the girls also did a, a similar period on the land. And there was also the land deeds, which was a much longer term business. Youngsters were sent off, often into the eastern areas, to organize farming in the occupied parts of uh, Poland and so forth. And a sort of youngster of 17 would be expected to go and tell the Polish farmers how to run their farms properly. And that wasn't always very popular or very easy to do. Overseas children of German nationals were encouraged to become members of the Hitler Youth, and in so doing, taking part in the homeland struggle. Membership was also open to foreign nationals who were sympathetic to the Nazi ideal. There were units in Europe, South Africa, Brazil, America, Asia, even in Australia, although by the outbreak of war, many of these Nazi activities were banned. New organizations were formed in many of the occupied countries. It was the dream of Baldur von Schiller to unify all of these organizations, together with the Italian state youth, 
into one vast and grand European Youth League. The Hitler Youth was very keen to recruit people of German extraction, perhaps of German parentage, or um, even more remote than that, in foreign countries. Again, they were very keen that these youngsters should come back and visit the fatherland, and so there was a lot of organization of trips coming in. Uh, all over the world you would find these so-called Auslands, Hitler Jugend, the overseas or foreign units. Um, in America there were a lot of them, um, China even had them, and Australia, it was all over the world. There were. In fact, even in England there was a small unit. I haven't been able to find out much about that, but I did discover purely by chance that the leader of the English Hitler Youth movement uh, was killed in Russia. But uh, the idea was that we're all Germans and, of course, potentially we are going to come and take over the countries. And it was a very good idea to have an organization on the spot. And again, with any luck, these youngsters would be keeping an eye out and learning things about their country, which would be useful to the Germans when they came in. In the same way, there was a lot of visits from Germany out into other foreign countries. And the youngsters there were told, just keep your eyes open and have a good look at the railway bridges and the other things. And then maybe one day you'll go back there as a soldier and you'll know that the road bridge has been blown up until three miles down the river, there's a railway bridge we could get over. In other words, they were doing a sort of low-level spy, sort of intelligence gathering. It's all part of the great plan that Germany is going to spread further and further and further. And we will have our little units there being active. When war came on September 1st, 1939, the youth of Germany were better prepared physically and psychologically than that of any of the other combatants. War was the obvious outcome for the Hitler Youth from all that had gone before. It was the ultimate object of all their many years of training. The response to the call for volunteers was immediate and overwhelming. In the first four weeks of the war, some 1,091,000 young people had offered themselves for military service. Those in the Hitler Youth too young to fight took the place of men which had been drafted into the forces. They took over their jobs in the postal and telegraph services, the railways, the trams, the police, and also as couriers to the armed forces.
not assisted in the hospitals or with family welfare work. Hardly any aspect of civilian life which suffered a loss of manpower to the armed forces was outside the scope of the Hitler Youth. The German agricultural economy could probably not have survived without the volunteers on the land. They trained and manned the air raid warning posts. They worked with the fire brigade and flak helpers. By 1944, in a final attempt to stave off defeat, all German males between the ages of 16 to 60 were mobilized in the home guard. And towards the end, everyone from the 10-year-old young Volk boy upwards was required to bear arms in the defense of the fatherland. There were many specialist units formed in the Hitler Youth, coming under the direct command of the SS. There was the SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend. The Hitler Youth Assault Craft Flotilla. Motor Hitler Youth. The Flieger Hitler Youth. The Marine Hitler Youth units. And the medical units of the Hitler Youth. Although by the end of the war, the Hitler Youth came to number almost 10 million boys and girls in a highly organized and extremely unified body, it was never actually disbanded. It simply faded away, as did the rest of the Nazi war machine into the ruins of the Third Reich. Perhaps it was because the beloved Führer Adolf Hitler was dead. Without Hitler, it was over. The dream, the fantasy, now all worthless. The Hitler Youth died with Hitler. The end of the dream for the Hitler Jugend was just simply that it faded away into nothingness. Obviously, as the Allied and Russian troops moved in, the activities ceased in the occupied countries. A lot of them moved back from into central Germany. They were taken into uh, the Volkssturm and so forth. And eventually, when peace came, they, the hostilities ceased. They just disappeared. They tore up their uniforms. There are sad stories told of a boy who got the Iron Cross and he was told, get rid of your uniform and everything that shows you you had a military background. And he tells the tale how he dug a little hole, put his medal in, and there was the document saying that it had been awarded to him, and he tore that up and put it in, and he said that the paper and the medal were wet with my tears before I actually covered them over. It wasn't that he was burying just the medal, which he'd earned in, in, in action. It was that his dream was going with it. Perhaps the demise of the Hitler Jugend is best summed up in the words of Henrietta von Schirach, wife of Baldur von Schirach, accounting her experience whilst being held prisoner on Christmas Eve of 1945. I was given a bucket and the remains of an old uniform and told to clean the prison lavatories. I protested that the cloth was too thick and was given a torn flag instead. The ragged red-white-red with the black insignia that had once been a Hitler Youth flag. The flag which a lost generation had carried, loved and idolized.